Hello, dear friends. What do you know about the heart of your car? Its engine. What is it like? What could it be? Let's start with some technologies that are not groundbreaking, but are just modifications of fuel-burning engines. Here is an orbital internal combustion engine, which is called the Skyactiv X by Mazda, where the combustion methodology of a diesel engine involves synchronization of a gasoline one. And here is a rotary engine whose development was financed by the Department of Defense of the USA. There is another extraordinary engine with opposite piston design. The engine produces 30% fewer emissions compared with its counterparts, but its design cannot be considered fundamentally new. All these solutions that may seem innovative at first sight are nothing but improved old technologies created more than 100 years ago. You might think that engines that do not burn fossil fuels are things of science fiction, and they've not been invented yet. They have, in fact, existed for a long time. Let's start with generators that split water into oxygen and hydrogen, which in the English language are referred to as HHO generators, or water engines that we have already spoken about on our channel. Here is a typical HHO generator which consists of numerous plates not more than one millimeter in thickness placed in water. When voltage is supplied to the device, hydrogen and oxygen are generated. It is the simple process of electrolysis. There's a man living in the town of Baikonur who states that he has a similar generator heating his house. Moreover, it can also be used in vehicles. On YouTube, you can find lots of videos about how you can make a generator like this yourself. There are even more interesting inventions. In Technica Melodiosi magazine, as far back as in 1938, an article was published about the invention of a device using sunbeams and photolysis processes to turn water into oxygen and hydrogen. Professor Otto Mohr used the generated hydrogen as fuel for his gas stove and for heating his house. This invention allowed him to stop consuming gas from the local utility network because the unit did not require any additional expenses, unlike electrolysis and plates from the previous example. Here's another example from Russian news. A scientist from Stravopol assembled a simple unit for heating of his industrial premises. The powerful unit operates on used oil and uses water splitting to heat sheds. There are a great number of units of the kind. Different enthusiasts all over the world invent all kinds of things, but for some reason their inventions are not released for public use. What do you think is the reason? Perhaps it is because all the inventions would, mildly speaking, preclude oil corporations from squeezing the planet's population dry as if we are all on the oil needle. And here is an even more interesting technology, an air-driven engine. Yes, you've heard right. It's easier to imagine an engine operating on hydrogen produced from water because converting an internal combustion engine into a gas one is not know-how. This has been done for a long time. You can see fuel-burning cars on any road, but those driven by air, they seem to be something straight from science fiction. But there is an ordinary inventor who managed to make an identified flying object using simple plastic bottles filled with water and pumped with air. Then he decided to take it a step further and created an improved model of the engine. He filled a carbon cylinder with ordinary rainwater and pumped air into it under high pressure. And look what he got! He made a dragster that can exceed 100 kilometers per hour. For how long do you think? For half a second. Its maximum speed is 261 kilometers per hour. Do you still believe that a vehicle cannot be propelled by air? So what is the secret of compressed air-powered vehicles? This smiling man invented and already assembled an operable series production vehicle that is driven by compressed air and can cover 400 at 100 km per hour with a single filling of its compressed air bottle. This is what the Wonder Car looks like. It's small, lightweight and compact. It has some compressed air bottles underneath, a body and a space frame trimmed with plastic. You can see several compressed air bottles that are not very large. You might think that filling this or a similar machine with compressed air requires a lot of energy and money. However, the cost is quite low. Imagine oil magnates' eyes if they are told that vehicles can be powered by air. However, it's not a great problem. They are ingenious guys too. They will just introduce the long-expected air tax. By the way, a series production car of this kind was already released by Tata Motors in India. It can reach a top speed of 100 kilometers per hour and cover up to 130 kilometers. 
Yes, it is less than the figures mentioned earlier, but it's still quite a feasible technology that will allow driving with zero expenses if developed and improved. But then again, it could be another so-called disruptive technology that will be held off for years. There is a groundbreaking technology that is sure to be allowed all over the world. Please welcome the wood-fired car. By the way, many people have been using this design for a long time. There are even some ready-made drawings of engine units available, for example, for an old Zaguli Model 6 or 1. It involves some disadvantages too, apart from registration with the State Traffic Safety Inspectorate. The matter is, you have to wait for 20 minutes for the engine to warm up and start working properly, and the generator to be filled with carbon monoxide. And now let's move to technologically advanced Japan. This is the motorcycle that was invented there and named Sumo. It could reach a top speed of 100 km per hour, propelled by a magnetic engine, and cost about $2,000. It had a two-wheel drive, one wheel with a conventional electric motor, and the other one with a magnetic engine based on Minato technology. First of all, the motorcycle needs to gather speed. It requires a battery to power electric circuits, produces pulses and controls the magnet position. But it is still many times more efficient than its counterparts propelled by gasoline engines or conventional electric motors. So what does the motorcycle use as fuel? It is driven by a magnetic field. The technology can be used to create an inexpensive, efficient car. The precise principle of its operation was described long ago by the Russian inventor Svetitsky. Moreover, the patent for the invention was obtained as long ago as in 1997 in Russia. But however handsome and efficient it may be, it was also forbidden. The famous writer and sociologist Kurt Vonnegut once said, we are all addicts of fossil fuels. Meanwhile, it is obvious that the energy industry relying on hydrocarbons has become outdated. According to some reputable scientists' forecasts, global energy consumption will reach the amount of 25 billion tons of oil, or equivalent by the year 2050, which will obviously be disastrous for mankind. Meanwhile, most of us, at the best case, think of the cold nuclear fusion reactor as something associated with technologies of the distant future, while existing models that are nuclear reactors in miniature absolutely safe for the environment and humans are being assembled and not only in notional Tony Stark's laboratory. They are made by academics, scientists, and ordinary enthusiastic experimenters. Although this kind of energy is cheap and environmentally friendly, its industrial development is not being considered so far. Eugene Malov, a distinguished American research engineer, master of science, and the founder of the nonprofit fund New Energy Foundation, was one of the enthusiasts who tried to present mankind with cheap, cold fusion energy. In his book entitled Fire from Water, he provides a detailed description of the Fleischmann Pons experiment, in which he reproduced cold fusion energy on a desk. Malov was a proactive person, so he prepared and sent a memorandum on nuclear fusion to the White House, addressing it to Bill Clinton, and received a short formal reply in November 1993. And in 2004, Eugene was beaten to death at his own entrance hall. Several decades ago, the nuclear physicist Lev Maximov came up with a breakthrough project which could steer Russia out of the upcoming crisis and ensure its leadership in the world power industry top list for years to come. Lev suggested that nuclear power plants using conventional fuel be upgraded and replaced with underground thorium stations. The use of safe thorium inside of uranium eliminates the danger of radioactive contamination in case of any accidents, and at the same time solves the global environmental problem related to the disposal of spent nuclear fuel. A thorium nuclear reactor with fundamentally new thermal elements is able to operate for up to 50 years without recharging, while a uranium one pollutes the planet with nuclear waste every 18 to 24 months. USA energy agencies offered millions to Lev Maximov as the patent holder for his participation in the development of the American energy industry. According to the Gore Chernomerdin uranium deal, all reserves of thorium uranium, 500 tons, required to launch the thorium reactor were to be transferred to the USA before 2013. The deal was estimated at $12 billion, whereas the actual cost of the country's strategic stock was $8 trillion. In 1999, Lev Maximov survived a second attempted assassination. The only thing that let Maximov escape was the attacker's incompetence. But other members of Maximov's group were not so lucky. All physicists who had worked with him died under strange circumstances. 
When it comes to absolute power, such a small thing as human life does not count, and cheap energy is only one of the spheres of influence. The body of the famous 57-year-old biophysicist Don Wiley, a recipient of the Lasker Basic Medical Research Award, was found in the Mississippi River in December 2001. The police unanimously declared it to be a deliberate crime, but FBI officers reclassified it into an accident, resulting from falling from the bridge. No explanation was offered as to how it could happen with a two-meter high safety fence. Dr. Wiley is known to have been one of the leading experts in anthrax, Ebola fever, and AIDS virus. Another known fact is that in the same year 2001, two months earlier, four persons died of anthrax germs from contaminated letters, and Dr. Wiley was then one of few people who could trace the origin of the powder with a high degree of probability. However, three Pakistanis were hastily declared responsible for the incident. There is nobody who could estimate the probability of mere coincidence, but only in December 2001, six famous geneticists and microbiologists passed away under equally strange circumstances. That's the unfriendly world we have created for ourselves. Or not exactly ourselves, someone could have participated by changing human society purposefully. After all, these and numerous other deaths and persecutions of the best representatives of mankind are so similar in their scenario that the probability of mere coincidence can be excluded. Sooner or later, those parasitizing on the planet are to become outcasts instead of being the most respectable people as they seem to be now. And we'd like to see it happen as soon as possible. Is there a way we can accelerate this process? Yes, there is. We can do it if we unite our efforts in search of the truth and, of course, if we share this video with our friends. Thank you for your feedback and comments. See you next time.